Good morning. Ohio Gozai Masu. I am honored to moderate this important spotlight session today. I have been privileged to work with older adults in my clinical practice and to have undertaken research studies to further understand the efficacy and evidence-based practices to advance the discipline of music therapy. As the population of older adults continues to increase, there will be a greater need for a range of holistic health care services for aging and well-being. The prevalence of older adults diagnosed with dementia is expected to rise to 65.7 million in 2030. Engagement in the arts and culture has been correlated with a longer life expectancy in the older adult population, even after controlling for a number of variables, such as long-term disease, social network, smoking, and physical activity. And as we all know, music is one area that is receiving more attention and has so many benefits for the aging adult population. In this morning's session, we have a number of learning objectives that will be accomplished. You will learn about the challenges for an aging society. You will learn about the role of clinical music therapy to support healthy aging strategies for older adults. You will learn about the role of caregivers and collaboration with music therapists to support those who are living with dementia. You will learn about therapeutic caregivers singing for older adults. And you will learn all of this from leading experts from Australia, Japan, South Africa, and Denmark. Today, you will be treated to hear four dynamic speakers. Dr. Hannah Mete Ritter will discuss the importance of caregiving and music therapists in working towards wellness for older adults diagnosed with dementia. Dr. Imogen Clark will highlight how music therapy can support the management of age-related diseases in her country with a focus on healthy aging. She will acknowledge the complexities of aging and how the research might inform delivery of music therapy for older people and their families living in the community to support well-being. Dr. Mayu Kondo will discuss the role of music therapy for Japanese older adults while providing context regarding current practices. The role of therapeutic caregiver singing will be explored by Ms. Karen Stewart as she will present a pilot study that explored the therapeutic use of singing as a resource in providing care for the elderly. Each speaker will present their talk and at the end of the session, I will provide a brief summary of each of their presentations. This will be followed by an opportunity um, to engage the speakers in dialogue in a short question and answer period. So I encourage you to take notes if you have a question that you would like to ask at the end of the session. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Hannah Mette Ritter from Denmark. Dr. Ritter is a professor and head of the, director, head of the doctoral program in music therapy at Aliborg University in Denmark. She teaches music therapy students and has extensive clinical experience in gerontology. She leads research on music therapy in dementia and is engaged in various international research networks. In her talk, we will learn about an in-depth interview that was carried out to understand the benefits of musical interaction on well-being in dementia and caregiving, the exploration of best practices of caregivers' use of music, and how music therapists may play a role in facilitating caregiver competencies. Welcome, Dr. Ritter. Dear organizers, dear audience, I'm very honored and thankful to be given the possibility to present our research in progress. Research about music therapy and dementia that in these years is increasingly needed. With music, we have an important tool that is still not acknowledged and implemented 
to sufficient level. There are still many unused potential, not only in the direct music therapy treatment, but also in how music is used in daily life. Dementia is a syndrome affecting cognitive functioning. It's not caused by increasing age, but as we see in the figure, there are some, um, uh, it's more common with old age, especially in high-income countries, Japan, Europe, and with enormous cost of care. Now, first, I would like you to meet Anne. Um, Anne took part in one of our interviews of caregivers. She lived with John in the center of town, and John suffered from dementia. She had no knowledge about dementia and did not know other people with dementia or any relatives. So she gained knowledge about dementia, about, she read about it. She didn't follow any groups. Um, and it was difficult for her to keep up her professional life. She was in her 70s, but still working. Uh, and she says that the slower he became, the more her tempo increased, and it made it more difficult for her. And additionally, Anne calls herself unmusical. Anne tells about John, who suffered from Alzheimer's disease, that he was a, a dedicated scientific researcher. He wrote his last, last book at age 83. He was a very empathetic person, but she saw a very fast progression of Alzheimer's disease, so he really easily became tired. Um, and also physically, uh, he became much weaker very quickly. His language deteriorated. In the end, there were only very few words left. And he did not understand the content of uh, television, of conversation. With John's severe cognitive decline, he required extensive help from Anne. And from research, we know that especially caregiver spouses report more depressive symptoms, greater physical and financial burdens, and lower level of physiological well-being. When Anne is asked about caregiving, she tells that on one side, she was really lonely because she had to make all decisions. But on the other side, John was still there, emotionally. She also talks about a grief because of all those possibilities that were gone. For example, being able to travel together. She also mentions when John for a period was hospitalized, that staff members at the hospital, their way of interacting with John made her angry and stressed. So talking about caregiving, she describes it as tough, but also it's a task, and at the same time it's not. She also describes it as a thank you to John for all those years they had together. So in one way, Anne is telling two stories about dementia. The negative stories about caregiver burden, but also the positive stories about the person she loves, a person who is still there, who is empathetic, who in moments is still adequate and is recognizing her and giving her comfort. By putting focus on the positive and salutogenetic stories about dementia, we are giving new perspectives on caregiving. And in our team, we are asking ourselves what we can learn from caregivers like Anne. We were especially interested in learning about why she chose to listen to music together with John. She tells about how they sat together in their sofa by the end of the day and listened to music. She tells that classical music was like his music and music became like a routine for them. And when the music started, he would lean back and doze and she tells that he would look so extremely happy. It was very difficult for John to walk. 
But when there was a concert in town, she described this as a driving force for him to get out of the door. And when they walked back after the concert, she would walk upright and more vitalized than before. She would also describe it as during the concert when music started that he was completely silent and she also described it as he was devout. So even if John had lost his words, there was still this person that she still could talk with somehow. She, he still listened and she felt that he could uh, still follow her. Um, he listened to her tone of voice, to her rhythm, and in some way he conveyed a type of empathy or recognition. When John was hospitalized, she tells that staff used too many words, and these words were meaningless to him. So the more the staff informed him, the angrier he got, and the more he listened to the voice instead of the words. So during his hospitalization, uh, when he was in hospital, Anne would play music for hours. And some staff members didn't like it, but she would then just close the door. After John's death, Anne tells that she is no longer able to listen to music. This research group, where I have some fantastic colleagues, is funded uh, by the Velux Foundation and hosted by Aalborg University. And we have a, a four-year period to carry out this research. And uh, we are interested in um, understanding the benefits of musical interaction, the best practice of caregivers' use of music, and how music therapists play a role in facilitating caregiver competences. Um, so we have used a hermeneutic phenomenological analysis for some of our interviews, and here combining first an inductive process where we try to keep as close as the narrative from the caregivers, but also a deductive process where we structure and integrate the categories and themes in a broader conceptual framework. This is just an example of how we do the coding process. And here we use the Invivo software which is helpful when it comes to give an overview of very complex coding processes. So here you can see the text bits uh, that were coded here experiencing music together and then with the codes on the left side and this visual overview on the right side. So you very easily uh, get a sense of what you're coding. So we followed a, a seven step procedure in the analysis. I will not go into details about that, but about first of all the transcriptions the deductive process, meaning condensation, and the synthesis. We were interested in the person with dementia, PVD, in the carer and in the staff, in their perspectives about how to use music in daily life. And from this, we had some overall themes uh, that we um, were, for example, who you are here and now, and connectedness. And, uh, these themes are described in a psychosocial model uh, by um, Ori McDermott. And for example, here when we had, when Anne tells about classical music was like his music, it's here coded under identity, the person with dementia and music. But also when Anne talks about how he listened to the tone of voice or to her rhythm, this is also coded under music and then under communication and again, the person with dementia. So we had these overall themes and focus on music, but also here trying to condense the function of music and how the caregiver describes this. So I will now give you some very complex slides uh, with the results from the analysis. And not from all the interviews, but only this interview with Anne. Uh, and in the theme, who you are, we learned that music is recognized and perceived as important and meaningful, that John used music receptively, and he lost the ability to perform music or to select music. And the person with dementia no longer had an integrate memory of music. He was not able to foresee the music, but he still had preferences for certain genres or types of music. 
and the person with dementia, the intrinsic tempo of the body seems to become slower in the progress with dementia. And we also saw that carers may underestimate their competences in using music or in choosing music. So um, when we go a step further here and try to condense which function the music has, we see it has a personalizing function. So listening to person like music in order to provide routine, stability, safety, and continuity. So this is a way to keep on living and also a ritualizing function, attending specific cultural, spiritual events, for example, concerts as a driving force. And the, the second theme, the here and now, here we learn that music is motivating, rewarding, and regulating, that music diverts, keeps you occupied. Also that the caregiver here talks about musical parameters in body language, in tone of voice, and that they are more meaningful than words and affect, posit uh, affect mood positively, but also negatively. And we also learn that Kara's choice of music here is based on direct observation when sharing music experiences. So going a step further here uh, and looking at the function of music, uh, here we see a territorial function so you can use music to mark the space as yours, that you are in control. For example, in a hospital setting like Anne did. And a signaling function where you can create a sound landscape, you can frame the environment, for example, playing specific music each morning. It has a recreational function where you can be occupied, listening alone to, to like music. But also a regulating function where you can regulate mood or arousal. And also, the way you can use um, different uh, uh, musical parameters in your, the way you approach in your body language, in your timing, and how you can also instruct carers to do this. And the third theme, connectedness. Um, here we learn about empathy, that despite loss of verbal language, the person with dementia is still able to um, to understand music and express music. And that carers may underestimate their competences in using a tuned musical interaction, so instead they may focus on the words. It is difficult to explain this attuned musical interaction, and this makes knowledge sharing between family and professional carers quite difficult. Music may trigger some very strong emotions and memories, and may serve as a key for connecting in an enriching and rewarding way. But music may also trigger grief and despair to a level where music is avoided. So here looking at the function of music, we see a communicative function. So musical parameters such as intensity, timbre, and so on, they seem to become increasingly important as the dementia progresses and also a relational functions that where music allows reciprocity and togetherness. So we find, just with this interview, but also in the others, we have some very interesting findings. And here, first of all, that this carer describes herself as unmusical, but still she used music in so many different ways. Also that caregiving is described as a burden, but this carer offered a genetic or health-focused perspective to dementia. So we saw this overall, these eight, or at least eight, there might be many more uh, functions of music that this carer was able to use following these overall themes. So discussing this, uh, we may ask ourselves um, if why would carers uh, think they are unmusical? And, and not be able to use music? How could other carers use music and which competences are needed? Could this couple have benefited from the use of music in other ways, for example, singing, as we will hear about later, or dancing maybe? And how can this tacit knowledge about music interaction be used systematically and professionally? So uh, there are some 
important questions here about how the professional music therapists can promote well-being in persons with dementia and support carers and contribute to change in culture of care. And in this way, also increase interdisciplinary collaboration and the professional competences. So just very shortly, there's a lot of literature about music therapy and dementia. So here I've only listed the meta reviews. And there are also quite some uh, literature about how carers use music. And some pioneers have described the way that music therapies play a role in using music together with carers. And here we see really an increase in research studies. And I think also after uh, this World Conference, I can see there's really a lot going on in this area. And you will hear much more about this. So the credential music therapy really may play an important role in ensuring well-being in dementia by facilitating use of music in daily life for the person with dementia and carers. And this may be through individual music therapy, through teaching, supervision, coping of carers, and through group activities and interdisciplinary work. Thank you for listening. Especially thank you to Anne and to the organizers. And I would also like to use this opportunity to give you a very warm welcome to the 11th European Music Therapy Conference in exactly two years in Olbo. Thank you very much. So thank you very much, Dr. Ritter. I'm going to welcome our next guest speaker, Dr. Imogen Clark from Australia. Dr. Clark is a postdoctoral research fellow and lecturer at the University of Melbourne and clinician at Austin Health. Dr. Clark is an early career researcher with focus on aging and neural rehabilitation. She is editor-in-chief for the Australian Journal of Music Therapy and the author of 16 publications. We will now learn about how innovative music therapy interventions address aging policy and the burden of age-related health care. Arigato, hope I said that correctly. What an honour it is to be here and thank you very much to the organisers and the World Federation of Music Therapy for inviting me to do this speech. So, getting old. Is it really the drag that the Stones wrote about? Sure, there really are some challenges and we're going to hear about those over the conference. But it is also a privilege to grow old and something that most of us aspire to do. As our global population continues to grow, people over the age of 65 are starting to drive a more positive image of ageing. In this presentation, I'm going to concentrate on older adults in the community and how we as music therapists can help them to access, access music to maximise their own health, independence and well-being. The term healthy ageing is used pretty broadly and defined by the World Health, Health Organisation as the process for optimising opportunities of health, participation and security in order to enhance the quality of life as people age. And this perspective of ageing also recognises the massive contributions that older people themselves can continue to make to society in, the older year, in, the later, in, their, in their later years. In Australia, the government recognises two policies that are critical in supporting healthy ageing among older adults living in the community. And of course, these are replicated around the world. And I'm going to focus my presentation on these two areas with two research projects. The first one is preventative health with a focus on healthy lifestyle habits, such as getting enough physical activity and eating the right foods. And the second one is this living longer, living better idea, which supports older people to live independently in their family homes for as long as possible, and also recognises the need to support home-based family caregivers. 
These agendas are pretty personal to me. This is my family. They are the red thread of my story today. My mum, pictured here, has a cardiac condition. She has heart disease. She's encouraged to re incorporate regular walking into her daily life just to stay healthy. Meanwhile, my father, pictured here, has early to mid-stage dementia. He is becoming more and more dependent on my mum and us, his children, to support his independence and capacity to live in the family home. It's a really challenging situation. My mum's freedom to do the exercise she needs to maintain her personal health is curtailed by dad's needs for care. Meanwhile, my dad's long-term welfare is dependent on my mother's physical and emotional ability to care for him. In my experience as a music therapy clinician and researcher, and previously as a nurse, the situation represented here by my family is very common. I didn't plan to research issues experienced by my parents, but since cardiac disease and dementia are two of the most prominent conditions affecting the quality of life in older people. This was probably more inevitable than a coincidence. So first to my mum and research for people with cardiac conditions. I examined how music therapy involving listening to participants selected music during exercise based walking could support older adults with health conditions to meet the recommended amounts of physical activity. So what are those amounts of physical activity? What is my mum expected to do every day? Well, she's expected to walk at moderate intensity, so brisk walking, for about 150 minutes every week. So around 30 minutes over five days of the week. And her exercise only counts if she walks for at least 10 minutes at a time. As you can imagine, this is pretty challenging for someone who fears another heart attack, is afraid to exercise alone, and has restricted time owing to the care needs of her husband with dementia. So how might music therapy help my mum to achieve the amounts of physical activity she needs to stay healthy? Well, we reviewed 23 theoretical papers and books discussing auditory motor processing of music during exercise. And we came up with this conceptual framework for any adult, that is, over the age of 18 years. The main points being that listening to music while exercising arouses or promotes physiological responses that are supportive during exercise and also positive subjective experience again, experiences also supportive during exercise. And these influences from music might help people to exercise at higher intensity and more frequently, leading to changes in behaviour and improved compliance with the physical activity guidelines. So I tested this theory in a randomised control trial with 56 older adults who had just completed cardiac rehabilitation. I randomly allocated them to either a music therapy experimental group or the standard care control group. Participants in my experimental music therapy group were guided using the conceptual framework that I just told you about to select unlimited playlists of preferred music that they expected to find supportive to listen to during walking-based exercise. And helping my participants to select this music was a pretty complex task, I must say. I sat with each of them for around two to three hours. I listened to their life stories and helped them to find exactly the right music for them. And I really did draw on all my music therapy skills to do this. I made measurements at baseline at week six and week 26 and examined the amounts of physical activity achieved over seven day periods. And for this we used 
activity monitors, as you can see here today, being modelled by the Bee Gees over there on their right legs. And incidentally, Stayin' Alive was the most requested piece of music, which was quite interesting given the population. We also examined fitness or exercise capacity, exercise intensity, and blood pressure, body mass index, and waist circumference for the presence of cardiac risk factors. Music selected by my experimental group was also analysed for commonly occurring features and we conducted post-interviews with participants in the experimental group. Demographics are pretty much as you would expect for people with heart disease or cardiac disease. Mostly males over the age of 65 years. Most had unstable angina or chest pain or they had, were, were recovering from myocardial infarct or heart attack. I compared the results of my quantitative, qualitative and music analyses alongside the conceptual framework explained earlier. Looking at this, first row, this top row first, we can see that both quantitative and qualitative findings supported the concept of physiological arousal. Quantitative results demonstrated improved waist circumference among those in the music therapy group compared with our control group. Effects also suggested increased exercise intensity and improved exercise capacity, blood pressure and body mass index among our music therapy participants. Qualitative results further supported the concept of physiological arousal with participants explaining how music listening made them feel energised so they could walk faster. And looking at the music analysis, we can also see that the music had stimulative features and was in duple time, so would have supported walking-based exercise. Looking at this middle line and the concept of subjective experience, we can see from qualitative findings that participants experience positive mood, feelings of flow and meaningful associations from music listening. Participants explained that these positive experiences help them to manage barriers to exercise, similar to those that I explained for my mother earlier. And this concept of positive subjective experience was also supported by the frequently occurring characteristics in the music such as major key, diatonic tone and consonant harmonies. However, looking at this bottom line, we can see some discrepancies. Quantitative results did not support the notion that music listening changes beha exercise behaviour to the extent that our older adult participants were able to meet the physical activity guidelines. However, participants in our, in our music therapy group felt that listening to music while walking did actually have a positive influence on their exercise behaviour. So these results led to a reappraisal of that conceptual framework for older adults as opposed to adults of any age. As expected, we can see that music listening supported physiological arousal and subjective experiences for older adults. However, we're still unsure about its impact on exercise behaviour and the achievement of the physical activity guideline, uh, physical activity recommended in the guidelines. So older adults with health conditions in this study with cardiac disease experience psycho-emotional, physical and behavioural benefits from music listening that assisted them to manage barriers to physical activity. These benefits identified <coughs> in the qualitative results may explain our quantitative results where we saw some improved health such as improved waist circumference and exercise related outcomes such as walking faster. However, more research is needed with a larger sample size to see if these findings translate into improved exercise behaviour. We're also recommending that future research it augments the effects of this personalised music listening with an additional intervention. For example, songwriting is something I've been thinking about. 
OK, now to my dad and the other part of my research and the living longer, living better idea. And this policy was the impetus for a study that I'm working on with my colleague in Australia, Dr Jeanette Tamplin, where we examine quiet participation to improve the well-being and relationship quality of community dwelling people with dementia and their family caregivers. So most people in Australia with dementia live in the family home and they're usually cared for by a non-professional family caregiver. The family home with familiar people, environment and resources provides optimal living conditions for people with short-term memory loss such as those with dementia. And there are also economic benefits for both individuals and to society. However, relationship quality between the family caregiver and their loved one living with dementia has a direct impact on the caring experience. Burden of care also, and the capacity of the caregivers to provide recipients with, to live, to, so, with the capacity for care providers and their recipients to live together in the family home for as long as possible. Our project with community dwelling people with dementia and their family caregivers aims to improve this relationship quality as our primary aim. And we're also examining various quality of life and wellbeing outcomes for both people living with dementia and their caregivers. The project involves two separate studies using an explanatory sequential design. In study one, which I'm going to talk to you about briefly now, is a feasibility study using a single group pre-post design and qualitative interviews to test the appropriateness of the intervention and outcome measures for our next study, which will be a randomised control trial. So in this feasibility study, we had 11 people with dementia and their family caregivers, or 11 dyads. Our caregivers were around 76 years of age and our people living with dementia about 80. Qualitative, oops, I'm left slide behind there, okay. Qualitative analysis of interviews suggested that participants experienced a number of social, personal and cognitive benefits from their participation in a choir that was especially for people living with dementia and their family caregivers. For social benefits, couples or dyads enjoyed the fact that the choir was something they could do together, as opposed to other community activities that were specifically for carers or for people living with dementia. Participants also explained how the choir helped them to meet special people and develop valuable new friendships. There was a sense of understanding explained by one carer as a knowing that no one was judging anybody else. And this empathy was valued by carers in the group, with one carer explaining how even her siblings did not understand the way the others in the group did. For participants with dementia, this understanding meant that they could sing in a manner that they wanted and did not feel restricted, implying that they felt accepted. Participants also explained how the choir provided them with many personal benefits, such as feelings of happiness and pride. And one participant with dementia found that the choir lifted her mood to the extent that it was something to live for. Another participant with dementia explained how meeting new people, how the choir helped them to meet, feel more confident about meeting new people. Carers explained how they had expected the choir to be beneficial for their loved one with dementia, but were really surprised to find that there was a double benefit, that they also benefited from the choir. A number of participants felt that the choir had helped them to realise the importance of music in their daily lives. From a cognitive perspective, participants enjoyed the mental challenge of singing in the choir. Carers, carers were amazed to witness their loved ones remembering lyrics from one week to the next. 
One carer wondered how this ability to learn and remember song lyrics could be used to support activities of daily living. Carers also valued the opportunity to learn new skills such as part singing and playing instrument. And despite our very small sample size, our quantitative results were also interesting because we found sustained healthy ratings for relationship quality, quality of life and depression from baseline through to, week, through to weeks 10 and 20. And surprisingly, we actually also saw a significant improvement in self-rating anxiety among people living with dementia. So participants in this very small study were positive about their experience and it seemed that the choir helped them to sustain relationship quality and feelings of well-being in the face of a degenerative disease. And so successful was the choir that we faced an ethical dilemma. As research funding came to a conclusion and participants wanted to continue. Fortunately, we have been able to develop a sustainable model for this choir and will now factor this into our forward planning for the randomised control trial. And if you want to hear more about that, you can come along and see my presentation with Jeanette at the very next session. So back to the beginning. Ageing is indeed a family business and the experiences of my family are common. It's not just about a particular disease or the best practice for managing that disease. It's way more complex. As we know, music is a very valuable resource. However, for older people who do not have the technical skills or are socially isolated, it can be really difficult to access and benefit from music. An important consideration for us as music therapists going forward is how we can empower community-dwelling people, older people and their families to better access and use music for themselves in ways that support them to live bravely, independently and joyously for as long as possible. Thank you. Arigato. And thanks, you're awesome. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Clark. Please join me in welcoming our next speaker, Dr. Mayu Kondo. Dr. Kondo is Associate Professor of Music at Tokai University in Japan. We are privileged to hear her speak today about the current state of music therapy practice for the elderly in Japan and the possibility of prevention or delay as possible outcomes of long-term care. Good morning, everyone. My name is Mayu Kondo. In this presentation, I'd like to talk about the existing states and the task of music therapy for Japanese older adults. And actually, I am very, very nervous now <laughs> because this is the first English presentation in my life. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry that I can't speak English well, and you may find my English hard to understand, but I try my best. <laughs> okay, and now, let me start with introducing some aspects of Japanese culture. We have a lot of great things in Japan. For example, Mount Fuji, cherry blossoms, temples, shrines, and castles. There are also many popular sightseeing spots, such as Kyoto, Kamakura, Tokyo, and more. Japanese food called washoku has been registered as a part of Japanese world heritage since, since 2013. Some famous example of fashoku are sushi on the slide. You know sushi? <laughs> I love it. 
and tempura, sukiyaki, soba, and natto. You may know the Japanese words kimonos, matsuri, kabuki, sumo, ninja, samurai, and budo. These are well known traditional Japanese things. Recent aspects of Japanese culture, including anime, cosplay, are getting popular too. And I believe one of the finest points of Japanese culture is omotenashi, which means Japanese hospitality. I mentioned some famous features of Japanese culture. But Japan is also facing the problem of an aging society. Japan's population is aging at a very rapid rate. The average life expectancy at birth of Japanese people is 83.7 years old, which is 12 years longer than the world's average. So there's no doubt that Japan has one of the longest life expectancies in the world. And I will be referring to average life expectancy at birth as ALE from now on. Okay, now let's go to the next slide. According to 2050 statistics, the total population of Japan is about 127 million, and 26.7% of that. One in four Japanese people are senior citizens now. The rate will increase in the future. Experts estimate that in 2035, it will be 33.4%. It means one in, one in three people will be seniors in Japan. Not only Japan, but many other countries are facing the same situation. So taking measures to support an aging society is necessary around the world. And the question is, what are the problems with an aging society? There are a lot. When people get older, of course, the risk of injury, sickness, depression, and dementia increase. Some people are not able to work anymore. Some can't find housing. Their funeral often take place a long time after their death. This current situation is hard for both seniors and their families. In Japan, there are not enough young people to take care of elderly people anymore. Some people have to quit their jobs to take care of their parents. Some feel tired, stressed out, or have too much pressure and even commit suicide after long-term care. The costs of public medical insurance and social security are getting higher on top of all that. It's a tough situation, isn't it? So the important thing is to, healthy, he sorry, to stay healthy and live longer. Extending healthy life expectancy is what we need. What is healthy life expectancy? Healthy life expectancy is a term people can stay healthy and live independently without health problems and support from others. Therefore, the gap between average life expectancy and healthy life expectancy is a term people need support from others. And I will be referring to healthy life expectancy as HLE from now on. Let's continue to the next slide. 
The graphic chart shows the difference between ALE and HLE. The term of HLE is about 10 years shorter than ALE for both men and women. That means, generally speaking, for the last 10 years of their life, elderly people have some health problems and need some support from others. This 10-year period of time is a term that people have more difficulty staying healthy. For that reason, we need to have longer healthy life expectancy. Extending healthy life expectancy is more and more important. Now, why don't we go to the next slide and take a look at the number of patients with dementia. According to the Health Ministry, Labor and Welfare Report in 2013, 15% of senior citizens were patients with dementia. The number will increase, and it is said the rate of patients with dementia will be one in five in the future. I'd like to clarify this point. 25% of the total population in Japan are seniors, and approximately one-fourth of them have dementia or mild cognitive impairment. What can music therapy do for this situation? I believe there are many things we can do through music therapy. And first, I'd like to talk about the situation of music therapy today for elderly people. In Japan, group music therapy is more common than individual music therapy. And it takes place in a hospital or a care center in most cases rather than home. One of the reasons for this current situation is because a music therapist is not qualified as a national license, and only a few music therapists can have a chance to work now. Well, anyway, since the purpose of music therapy for elderly people is stimulus, we have more active music therapeutic sessions than passive ones. Singing is a main activity for music therapy in Japan, especially when it is for preventing dementia. We often sing songs while doing other activities. Here are some examples of active music therapy for seniors. In the left picture, these elderly people are singing songs which were popular when they were young. In the right picture, we are singing a song while clapping with other people. We often have more active music therapeutic sessions with playing the musical instruments, body movement, while watching therapeutic materials. As Japan's population is aging fast, there will be more patients with dementia and more seniors who need support from others. Therefore, for reducing the risk of dementia and other diseases, extending healthy life expectancy is really important. I believe music therapy is one great way to achieve that. However, music therapy must be recognized and accepted more in Japan. We need a better education system to have more skilled therapists. So elderly people can take good quality music therapy wherever they are. In addition to that, more research on the effectiveness of music therapy must be conducted. Proving the effectiveness of music therapy with both 
qualitative and quantitative approaches as getting objective evidence will help music therapists to give better treatment for patients. It will lead to improvement in the quality of music therapy. Eventually, the constant effort may, sorry, the constant effort may make it possible for music therapy to become a national qualification. And musical therapeutic treatment will be covered by medical insurance. Then there will be more opportunities for music therapists to work. We are facing the serious problem of the aging society right now. I hope we will help elderly people not only to live longer, but stay healthy and enjoy the rest of their lives with the help of music therapy. There are many issues to overcome, such as staying healthy, preventing dementia, and having good relationships, etc. Music therapy is one of the most helpful ways to overcome these issues. And I strongly believe what we are doing for elderly people is also something beneficial for Japan. We are ready to take part in making Japan a better society through music therapy. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Kondo. Our final speaker today is Ms. Karen Stewart from South Africa. After completing her Master in Music Therapy program at the University of Pretoria in 2007, she joined Music Works, a nonprofit organization that provides music therapy services in under-resourced areas of Cape Town. Currently, she is in private practice in the field of special needs, trauma, elderly care, and palliative care. She is currently a research supervisor for the Masters of Music Therapy program. And today, Ms. Stewart will share about a pilot study that explores the impact of caregiver singing during morning care routines with persons having dementia. Thank you, good morning. Ohai gozaimasu, huyamore and saubona from South Africa. I'm gonna start us off with a quote, a Zulu proverb, umuntu ungumuntu ungabantu. This is a Zulu proverb meaning the human being becomes human through other human beings. Now for me, this proverb links very well to the concept of personhood, which Kit Wood and Breden in the late 1990s described as a standing or a status bestowed on one human being by others in the context of a relationship. This notion underlies their concept of the person-centered care, and it has informed a lot of my work in South Africa with the elderly. So South Africa is a country characterized by contrasts. This is reflected in our diverse landscape and our diverse cultures. This diversity is as much a blessing as it is a challenge. We can drive past elite mansions overlooking pristine beaches, and two suburbs away we can drive through the poorest of poor communities who struggle to gain access to running water, electricity, and sanitation. Within these contrasts, though, there is a unifying love of sport, especially rugby and soccer. We love brine, which is our word for barbecues. In fact, we love it so much that we have a national braai day where everybody braais or barbecues. And we have the big five, all of whom who are safely in our nature reserves and not wandering our city streets. There is a rich heritage of music making, storytelling and dance in the many varied culture groups that make up our nation. We have a population of 55 million and we have 11 official languages. We also have a tumultuous history that includes the apartheid regime where the Group Areas Act dictated that any persons classified as non-white were forcibly removed to areas far less resourced than those of the privileged white suburbs. During this time, many received inferior education, limited access to basic human amenities, healthcare and jobs. 
Now, although apartheid ended in 1994 and much has changed for the better, we're still reeling from the inequalities. In fact, according to the CIA, South Africa is the third most unequal country in the world. So we're dealing with increases of diseases of poverty, such as HIV, AIDS, and tuberculosis, as well as diseases of prosperity, which are associated with longer life expectancies, for example, dementia. The 2016 World Alzheimer Report stated that there are 4.4 million people over the age of 60 living in South Africa. And according to our most recent statistics, there are 2.2 million people living with dementia in South Africa. Now, of course, we're in 2017 now, so that has increased. The field of geriatrics in South Africa is under-resourced. We don't have a national care plan or a policy in place, which has led to very low awareness of the prevalence and the impact of dementia. There are fewer than 10 geriatricians and less than five old age psychiatrists for a population of 4.4 million. Again, we see stark contrasts in uh, equality. The private sector provides access to medical resources for the 16% of the population who can afford it. And our public health care sector provides the, the remainder, 84% of our population, and it's understaffed and underfunded. So we have private old age facilities that are well resourced and can provide access to therapeutic services. And we have public old age facilities that can only provide the basic amenities of nutrition. The other challenge that we face is that caregivers working with older persons often lack adequate need, especially in the provision of person centered care. In a 2010 research study, Dr. Kalula from the University of Cape Town reported that the lack of awareness of dementia amongst healthcare professionals and family members resulted in a delay of a referral. In a 2016 qualitative study by Van Veek and his colleagues, found that the training of caregivers in how to care for and respond to distressed behaviors was inadequate and sorely needed. Thinking about cultural implications, Cornia and his colleagues found that in some South African cultures, dementia symptoms were often attributed to witchcraft, punishment from ancestors, and that dementia could be cured by traditional healers known as sangomas. This may put many older persons at risk of abuse and, and harm, especially in our under-resourced communities. Differences in culture may also impact the provision of and the experience of person-centered care, and that can play a role in the quality of the interaction and the relationship between the caregiver and the staff member and the resident, who are most likely from different culture groups. Let's shift now to music therapy in South Africa. So we are a very young field in South Africa, less than 50 music therapists registered with our Health Professions Council. And because the field is still new, there's little awareness as to what music therapy is. There are very few posts available. So some music therapists work in private practice with a variety of clinical settings. And we have to be quite entrepreneurial in terms of creating work opportunities for ourselves. Currently, there are six music therapists doing work in older persons. And only three of them view music therapy, uh, elderly care, as a special clinical interest. Now, as we know, music therapy can have a meaningful impact on the provision of quality care that promotes personhood, not only for that of the older person, but for that of the caregiver themselves. And this involves a move to the more kind of community music therapy stance. So we work with the client as well as the, the system in which they function. Laura Beer, in 2016, writes that the use of modal and expressive ways of communicating through music is something that we as music therapists can share with caregivers. So in South Africa, the vast need for therapeutic services for older persons, the limited number of music therapists, and the limited training afforded caregivers lends itself to us broadening our role to encompass that of caregiver training. And this could potentially have a greater impact on the number of elderly persons receiving person-centered care. At the moment, there's little being done in terms of research in South Africa, so there are many, many opportunities to explore this in the older person field. So with this in mind, I decided to undertake a small qualitative study inspired by the work of Hamar and Gottel 
in Sweden, and I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Over several years, they explored the impact of caregiver singing during morning care routines with persons with dementia. None of the researchers, researchers are music therapists, yet they state that there is a vast and unexplored potential in using singing and music with caregivers to enhance the intimate nature of the caregiver-patient relationship. The other inspiration behind my desire to do this research is my personal interest in the concept of personhood, because I view music as a really meaningful vehicle to foster this not only in the person with dementia, but the caregiver themselves. So I wanted to explore how this caregiver singing might impact the person with dementia, the caregiver, as well as the relationship between the two. So the study was undertaken at a local semi-private old age facility, and that is the view, lovely table mountain in the background. And uh, morning care routines were chosen, as this is a time of day where distressed behaviours like agitation, aggression and confusion are elevated, making washing and dressing a particularly difficult activity for caregivers to accomplish. Four persons with severe dementia were randomly selected, with a mini mental Falstein of less than 10 out of 30, because that indicates severe dementia and four caregivers volunteered to be part of the pilot study. So I had four dyads. Ethical considerations were adhered to, such as familial informed consent and verbal assent. Briefly, in terms of the methodology I used, each dyad was videoed during what I called the usual morning care routine of washing and dressing. I personally took the videos and I ensured that each resident was comfortable with my presence by gaining verbal assent. All care was taken to uphold the dignity of the person by being strategic in my placement in the room, as well as what I included in the frame of the video. The use of researcher as participant was very helpful because I could make first-hand observations about the interaction and the communication that I witnessed. I then conducted a pre-workshop semi-structured interview with the caregivers on their experiences of the morning care routine and in caring for those with dementia, and this was recorded via audio. The following week, I did the therapeutic caregiver singing workshops with the caregivers, the volunteers, as well as some of their colleagues. Now, this workshop that I'd created is an experiential one. It includes a lot of singing and practical music making, using their musical experiences as a starting point. I used musical activities to transfer basic communicative music skills, as well as concepts of the musical elements like timbre, tone, melodic contour, pitch, etc. I also introduced them to the concepts of mirroring, matching and attunement, as well as the Nordoff Robbins concept of the music child, which I feel is a vital stance in the dementia field because despite the layers of confusion, memory loss, agitation, there is still a healthy aspect of this person that can be unlocked through music. The workshops also included some information on the impact of singing and music on our brains, bodies and emotions. And I made sure that they knew that this was not music therapy, but rather a more meaningful way to use singing in their work. I also made sure that they knew they didn't only have to sing during morning care routines, that they could apply this during the day as they saw fit. I then did a second round of videos during the singing morning care routines, this time with the caregivers applying that which they'd learnt and practised during the workshop. Another interview was conducted a week later, purposely giving the participants time to apply this with various in, uh, residents so that I could get a good sense of how they were experiencing this new way of interacting with residents. So in terms of the data analysis process, which was peer reviewed, I transcribed the, video, the interviews, I wrote thick descriptions of the video content, coded and categorized all of the data. And the themes that emerged were then shared awareness, shared enjoyment, shared engagement, and shared intention. And I used the word shared quite purposely because I really felt there was often a sense that both the carer and the residents were sharing all of these four things, this awareness and enjoyment. It wasn't just felt by the carer uh, in isolation. So I'm briefly just going to describe those, that, the results that I found. So with shared awareness, both the carer and the residents showed more awareness of each other. They looked at each other more often and there was an increase in eye contact. 
This meant that the carer was better able to respond to the resident's nonverbal communication, for example, a facial expression or a movement of pain. This was in stark contrast to the usual morning care routines, where the carers seemed quite perfunctory in their actions and they did not often look at the resident. Carers commented that the residents seemed more alert when they were singing to them, and one carer, very surprised, she said, they do look at you and they smile. So with shared enjoyment, the second theme, there was a noticeable difference in facial expressions of the carer and the resident between the usual and morning, uh, singing morning care routines. In the latter, there were more smiles and laughs, a more relaxed atmosphere, as well as more energetic and animated responses from the carer and the resident. There seemed to be a positive shift in mood, with one carer noting that the singing made it joyous. Playfulness seemed to emerge, seen in the laughter and the gentle teasing, and there was even a joke initiated by one of the residents. One carer reported that her resident was in a terrible mood, and after she'd been singing with her for a while, this resident started humming, and according to the carer, her whole mood changed. Several carers mentioned that they themselves felt in a better mood for the rest of the day. With shared engagement, all four residents started singing or humming along with the carers. Some of them would clap their hands, there were some dance movements by one of the others. Whereas the usual morning care routines were characterized by a lot of verbal instructions and long moments of silence, I found that the singing care routines, both carers and residents, were more verbally responsive. The use of songs from the residents' past created opportunity for nostalgic conversations, initiated by both the carer and the resident. Added to this, there was more intimacy through touch and affection. Residents expressed affection more often, as did the carers. And this was different to what I'd seen in the usual morning care routines. Instead of just using touch to move an arm to put it in the sleeve of a jersey, this was really an intimate touch. So while the carer was singing, there was a touch on the cheek or a stroke on the arm. That seemed to really cement the intimacy of the relationship and the moment in a very human way, which I think is a vital and basic emotional need in every person, including someone with dementia. Lastly, shared intention. In the usual morning care routines, carers seemed intent on completing their tasks and the residents were purely passengers in the process. The use of singing seemed to support the carer's attempt to perform the tasks as it promoted more compliance from the resident. The shift in positive mood seemed to allow the resident to share this intention of the carer, which was getting washed and getting dressed. It was noticeable that although there were less verbal instructions, there was more independent movement and decision making from the resident. They were helping pull up the pants, helping put on the jersey, helping do up buttons without being asked to do so. The carers commented that it was easier to do the care routine with the music. And one of the aspects that arose was the sense of empowerment that the caregivers felt. One of the comments was from the initial interview before the workshop was that the carers often didn't know what to expect when entering the room. They were uncertain of how the resident would react to them in terms of agitation and the distressed behaviours. And it seemed now that the therapeutic singing provided a resource for them to cope with the distressed behaviours. So this way of working views singing as a resource, a motivator, a communicator. But for me, the most important thing is that it's a connector. It connects the resident to his abilities, his memories, enjoyment, sense of well-being. It connects the carer to his or her sense of empowerment and enjoyment, but it also connects the carer and the resident with each other in a very human way, which speaks of personhood and person-centered care. Now, although this is a small pilot study, <laughs> um, there may be meaningful implications, especially in South Africa, for the promotion of this person-centered care of the older person. It's cost-effective, it's relatively easy to apply, which is especially relevant in our under-resourced communities, and also because of the very few number of music therapists. It also highlights the need for future research in the field of music therapy with older persons in South Africa, and I'm very passionate to do this, so please watch this space. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Ms. Stewart. So I'd like to provide just a short summary um, that will help embark us on our question and answer period and engage in discussion. So today in uh, Dr. Hannah Mete Ritter's talk on the role of caregivers and music therapists for well-being in persons with dementia, she discussed that dementia is a syndrome affecting cognitive functioning. And people in mid to late stage dementia so severe cognitive decline and require extensive assistance to carry out their activities of daily living. Caregiving may be provided by family or by informal caregivers or by professionals, and it's reported as stressful as well as a physical, emotional, and economic burden. Dr. Ritter shared her work of a series of in-depth interviews that were carried out with the aim to understand the benefits of musical interaction on well-being in persons with dementia and their caregivers, to explore the best practice of caregivers' use of music, and to reveal how music therapists may play a role in facilitating caregiver competencies. Thank you, Hannah, for sharing how music therapists may play an important role in coordinating and facilitating family and professional carers' uses of music. In Imogen Clark's talk on music therapy to support healthy aging and management of age-related disease, she discussed music therapy for older people living in the community. She also presented the complexities of aging and how the research might inform delivery of music therapy for older people and their families living in the community to support well-being and joy for life, regardless of disease. In the first research project she presented on the role of music therapy to promote independent physical activity in community-dwelling older adults with cardiac disease, Results suggested that personalized music listening during exercise assists older adults with health conditions to exercise at increased intensity and manage negative experiences, leading to improved health outcomes. The second research project addressed the Living Longer Better policy, which focused on community-dwelling people with dementia and their caregivers. Thank you, Dr. Clark for sharing your research with us and highlighting how music can support healthy aging. In my and Dr. Mayo Kondo's talk on the current status of music therapy for the older adults in Japan, she highlighted how music therapy is typically provided in hospital or care settings and that pre most familiar music is most predominantly implemented over clinical improvisation. Thank you, Dr. Kondo, for educating us on music therapy practices with older adults in Japan and for conducting your um, lecture today in English. Quite a success. In Karen Stewart's talk on creating connections, she discussed how music, especially singing, is at the center of cultural events. She highlighted that with over 2.2 people living with dementia in South Africa, Access to quality care is often lacking, especially in rural and under-resourced areas. The pilot she presented explored the therapeutic use of singing as a resource in providing effective care for the elderly. Results illuminated the themes that she just shared. Shared awareness, shared engagement, shared enjoyment, and shared intention. Thank you, Ms. Stewart, for your talk and for acknowledging that in a culturally diverse and under-resourced country like South Africa, the therapeutic caregiver singing can be a valuable method of contributing to quality care of the resident without alleviating caregiver stress, as well as fostering the connection and relationship between the care and the resident. So again, I'd like to thank all four of our speakers today um, especially for sticking to their times, which allows us to engage um, in a question and answer period. Um, so I invite people um, to ask their questions. I'm not sure if there's microphones that will be provided um, in the audience for people that would like to ask questions. Hello, and thank you very much for a um, wonderful symposium here. Um, as someone involved in music therapy for older adults, 
I'm intrigued with the work that's going, around, uh, going on worldwide, and you represent some of the best models, I think. Uh, given that we're at the World Congress, and uh, Amy is uh, outgoing president of WFMT, I'm wondering if WFMT has a role in helping us to forge collaborations, collaborative research, collaborative writing, uh, working on protocols together, standardizing some of this work, offering more help to developing countries, um, and offering expertise from those researchers and clinicians who are senior in their work. Thank you very much for your question. Um, あの、ちょっと通訳をさせていただきます。え、皆さんのあのスピーチとてもあの参考になりました。WFMTの方では、え、今後高齢者に対しての研究などどのようなサポートをしていかれますかという質問がなされました。エミ先生よろしくお願い
all present us a question. え、今の質問なんですけれども、私はあの、などお聞かせください。Thank it's part of our lifestyle, it's part of who we are. And so connecting with dance therapists, and a lot of the theory I researched was connected with dance therapy research as well. So certainly collaboration would be welcomed. So happy to talk any time. <laughs> Is there any other person wanted to talk about the collaborating with dance therapists or yeah, I other? Uh, just therapists? I fully agree. Is it open? Yeah. That is that Imogen Clark talked about with activity. It's so important to move, and so many people still know how to dance. And as I mentioned with Anne, they had danced before, but somehow they stopped dancing, and I just wonder why. Maybe they just needed to be part of a group or something. So, so there re is really a need for knowledge mobilization, more knowledge sharing. And here we really need the interdisciplinary collaboration. ということで、あの、皆さんダンスはされるんですけれども、え、ダンスをしなくなるという現象があるんですけれども、その現象をえ、どのようにしたら彼らが動いていくのか、例えばその人たちの仲間意識を高めていくのかとか、そのようなことを一緒にコラボレーションしていけたらいいんじゃないか
<笑>はいえー、とダンスとのコラボレーションというのは私には経験がないのですがちょうどタイムリーに、えー、私の大学にダンスセラピーの先生がいらっしゃるということを最近知りました、えー、彼女はちょうどこの近くで障害を持ったお子さんと、えー、ダンスセラピーをやるという、えー、研究を今もされているということでしたのでちょうど本当にあの一緒に何かコラボレーションをしたいと思っていたところでした。えーダンスというのはその音楽がなければなかなかあの難しいことだと思いますのできっとあの一緒に共同して何かをやることで広がりが持てるのではないかというふうに考えます。また私の専門の領域からいきますとやはりその言葉で表現するということが非常にむずあの難しい方ですねでも私たちは日常的に多くの言葉を使っていて例えば「愚痴」とかですね私もよく言いますが「えー、すごい疲れた」とか「ちょっと聞いてよ」みたいなことをいろいろ言ってこう自分の思っていることを言葉にして相手に分かっていただいたり共感していただくことでかなりその気持ちが落ち着いたりするではその言葉という手段を不幸にも少なくなっていってしまう方たちにとってはその事故に溜まっていくものっていうのをいかに表現するかというところで考えると音楽を使って体で表現する踊りをするっていうことは非常にあのいいことではないかと思っていますのでぜひ今後研究をしたいというふうに考えています。Um, she said that, um... She didn't have experience to working with the dance therapist yet. However,、um, a, few week, a few weeks ago, she met someone who came to the, her university and talked about the collaboration or working together.、Um, she believed that、uh, dancing sometimes. Not sometimes, but、uh, need music. And、uh, music and collaborating, dancing, it's going to help for, for the clients because of the language.、Um, sometimes they are very hard to express their feelings with、uh, proper language, but they can properly express it with movement. So、um, she believes that collaborating with other professionals, such as dance therapists, will be a good,、um, good way for us to express、um, both and、um, that. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I think in South Africa, with art therapies in general being、uh, still quite young, there's a pro to that in a way because there's been a lot of collaboration between all the kinds of art therapies. So we have a national organization of art therapists, and、um, there's a lot of talking, advocacy. And on the ground level, I think there are many music therapists that I know of who are collaborating with occupational therapists, speech pathologists, et cetera, even neurologists and doctors. In terms of their work, not much has been written up, which I suppose is our next challenge、uh, in terms of research and writing up. But there's definitely, I agree, in terms of it's vital to be collaborating. I think that's where we're going to get a lot of rich material and that we can share even internationally. ST の先生または、えー、脳神経学の先生などいろいろな多職種の方々とコラボレーションする機会があると思いますですからあの私たちもあのもっと外に出ながら他の方々とコラボレーションをしていくことがとても重要だと考えますし特に私の国でも、えー、そのような機会を持ってリサーチを進めていくことが重要だと考えています。Hello, thank you very much for a fascinating morning so far. My question is for Karen specifically, but the other, others of you may wish to respond.、Um, Karen, I'm sorry, I can't remember if you said when your project took place, but I wondered if you had had any thoughts about whether the caregivers would carry on using their therapeutic singing techniques、uh, after you stopped cheering them on. And,、uh, Yeah, just your thinking around the longer term sustainability of change.
Thank you for that. I had thought about that. 特にカレン先生に、ちょっと、sorry。特にカレン先生にお聞きしたいんですけれども、この今後の長期のあの研究計画についてお話しください。I um I did the research about two years ago, and part of the research that I haven't written up yet is um three months after I did these trainings uh, in five other old age homes in South Africa. I sent out surveys um, questioning the caregivers about how they continued, what their experiences were, how they enjoyed it, how they perceived the caregiver,、um, the resident enjoying it. So, in terms of those four themes that emerged. And、um, they could, on a rating scale, say that they strongly agreed with the statement, for example, I feel the resident looks at me more often. Rating scale of between one and five, where I agree versus strongly disagree. So that was three months afterwards, which ensured that they knew that they were getting it in three months' time, so they had to continue working at it. And、um, the management of all of those centres were incredibly keen, and part of the collaborative team that's there are activity organisers or occupational therapists who were also incredibly keen on this. And because they'd witnessed The change in the resident and the interaction between the two almost in it almost created an impact on the environment of the care home, and because of that eagerness, I felt content that they would continue this. However, you're right. <laughs> Uh, a part of my future research would be to do a slightly more long, longer-term、um, kind of research study on on how that's going with the with the caregiver training. So, in one way. I can be certain that they're going. In the other way, I have faith that they're going on with it because they themselves felt that this was a really good way of connecting, and it made their work easier. I think if the, if it makes their work easier, hopefully they're continuing. Now, three months ago, I was looking at the results of this research. I was looking at the results. ケアギバー、介護士の方に対してあのその人を見るとか、えー、コミュニケーションを取っていくということがあの向上されていることが分かっていてそれをあ分かあの理解をしてくれている人たちが、ま、あの OT の先生だったり他のその人に関わる人たちがすごくあの介護を必要とする人たちを見るあのその人に注目するという環境ができているように考えられますそしてその環境を継続していくためのトレーニングをすることによってこれからの長期の研究につながっていくんだと考えています。My question goes to everyone on the panel who wants to answer to this.、Uh, from your experience,、uh, what are the most challenging ethical issues in doing research with people with dementia and the caregivers? 皆さんに答えていただきたいんですけれども、えー、一番チャレンジングな。I、um, hope you don't mind me speaking first, but this was, has, is very close to my heart and my colleague Jeanette, Dr. Jeanette Tamplin's heart too, because、um, we, we have been running this very successful research and we're about to talk about it more. But one of the carers actually said it's like being given a drug that works, that helps, and then having it taken away again. And so, factoring in sustainability is just so very important.、Um, And we've sort of worked working now with collaborators,、um, health systems, community health services in Australia,、uh, who are willing to come on board with and partner with us at the moment, which is、um, down to a lot of hard work, a lot of talks, and、um, still a work in progress very much.、Um, and we're also finding that our participants are so motivated about what we're doing that they're prepared to pay. As well, and at the moment, what they're paying is far too much. So they're actually paying, I think it's $15 a session each, which is a lot of money to pay for a session, but they keep coming.、Um, and I'd really, I think having a small contribution is important because it gives the participants a level of ownership and it means that their choir or their group is, is theirs and they therefore have that authority to. 
direct it to work where it goes. I can even see that they would employ the music therapist, they'd interview their music therapist and choose who they want for their group, that sort of thing. I think that's really important. But certainly $5 each is, is sufficient. So, yeah, it's a work in progress for us. Thank you. 一つのチャレンジとしては、えー、音楽療法を提供してそして、まあ、研究が終わったら音楽療法がなくなってしまうとあの、まあ、薬のようなもんですけれども継続して続けていくことというのがとてもチャレンジなんではないかなというふうに考えていますで特に音楽療法の場合はあの介護をされる方からあの先生の場合はお金をいただいているそうなんですけれども、1セッション15ドル、まあ、日本円ですると1500円ほど払っていただいているんですけれども、お金を払っていただくということで、オーナーシップ、その方が自分で音楽療法士をまあ雇っているというか、ちゃんとお金を払ってサービスを受けているという環境を作ることも重要なんじゃないかと考えています。And Dr. Clark talks about what they want. I think this is also an ethical issue that sometimes we, we see so many initiatives with music, with dancing, where sometimes people with dementia really get overstimulated. So we have our ideas about what is good for them, and we play music and we put in earplugs or everything. But, but if it's not really what the person with dementia likes, some might like listening to music, some might like singing, some dancing. So we really need also to be aware of the voice of the person with dementia and of course also the caregivers, really to look at what do they want, what do they need. 認知を認知症を患っている方っていうのは時にして多くの刺激が多すぎてしまうオーバースティミュレートになってしまうことが多いので音楽やダンスを通してその人が必要な刺激というものを伝えていく必要があると考えていますまた介護者の方にとっても音楽をすることによって刺激をその人に必要な刺激というかその人に必要なサービスというものを提供するということが必要になってくると考えています。I think one of the things that I've come across a lot is that、um, this coercion to do music and kind of echoes what you were saying.、Um, caregivers wanting to force this music is very good for you, so you have to do it, and you must shake the shaker. You must sing louder, do this, do that.、Um, <laughs> I've come across that quite a lot, and a big part of my training has, had, has been unlearning that for them. The fact that it's very much client based,、um, and that it's the dignity of the person, the decision making of the person. Whether it's passive participation or active participation, it's still participation.、Um, so I think, yeah, unlearning that in the caregiver and realizing that, that it might be the caregiver's desire for them to see an external manifestation of this enjoyment, but It's still based on the carer. The other thing, in terms of my research particularly, was、um, you know, we're working with severe dementia. So, how do I know my presence in the room is causing them to become uncomfortable or unsettled? Which is why I took very <laughs> big precautions in making sure that I got that verbal assent from them. Do I have your permission to be in this room with you right now?、Um, and do we have your permission to sing with you? Would you like me to? Um, in, personally, in my work, when I come into a session with someone with dementia and it's an individual session, I always show them, this is very practical, I always show them my instruments first and ask them, would you like to sing with me? Which is, I suppose, what a lot of us will do, but it is a kind of ethical gaining consent from them to be part of this. And if they say no, being okay with that as well. 介護者の方にとっては、まあ、音楽ってすごくいいことだという認識を持っていただけていると思うんですが、まあ、逆に言うとシェイカーを振りなさいとか、えー、鈴を振ったらいいんですよとかあのもっともっとあの音楽がいいんだからやりなさいというような形をとってしまうことがあるかもしれないんですが、えー、自分の私のトレーニングではそのたくさんの刺激を与えないようなその人にとって必要なサービスというものをその介護者の人に伝えていく作業をしています特にそれをクライアントベースあの認知症を患った方
もうだんだん重くなってくるとやりたくない時間があったりとか自分の意思を表現できないと思われがちですが思意思を表現されるやすいような質問をしたりしながらその人の意思を尊重したサービスを提供する形をとっていくことが大切なんではないかと考えています、えー、彼らに対して今日は音楽をやりたいですかと聞けるような介護そしてその時にその人がノーと言ったとしてもそれはノーで OK なんだということを認識してもらえるようなトレーニングを進めていくというのが重要だと考えていますはい、えー、チャレンジングな課題ということで、もう今この瞬間、私個人としては英語ですというふうにお答えしたいところですが、えー、リサーチの面で考えますと、私は認知症予防として有効なその音楽療法の方法であったり、音楽の持ち方というのをその客観的な指標で評価しようということで、えー、と脳の前頭葉の血流変化なんかを、えー、と取ってみて、研究をしているんですがその血流が増えたイコールその行った音楽療法は有効であるとかその脳画像検査をして光ったイコール有効であるというふうには結論付けられないというところが非常に難しいところでここが今あのどうしたらいいかなというふうに考えていますやはりこれはあのもう少し長期的に見ていって実際に認知症の発症率が抑制できたというところまで研究しないとそのようなふうには言えないというふうに考えておりますので継続して研究をしていきたいというふうに思っております、uh, With the challenge you asking me for right now is English And, um, and um, she said that um, um, it is important to continue to have research with the、um, brain、um, science also、um, because you can see a lot of、um, changes in the brain flow,、uh, blood flow, and,、uh, and the results. Probably showed、um, difference in between giving music and music therapy or not having a therapeutic、um, uh, propo- uh, perspective.、Uh, so she believes that、um, it is important for c o n t i n u e to have、um, research with the、uh, science and also. See the long term、um, results、um, in between、um, having a music and not having a music, and also how、um, changing with the dementia issues、um, throughout the,、um, her research. Sorry. I think、um, it, building off of what Dr. Kondo said. Um, one of the issues that I've had challenges in designing my research studies、um, have been finding accurate、um, tools to measure, right?、Um, because persons with dementia often can't tell us、um, how they are feeling and what that experience is like. And so it's finding、um, the tools to use in the studies.、Um, and certainly,、um, I know that there's also the ethical consideration when you are involving.、Um, You know, m- more invasive kind of testing measures like doing brain scans. And so I've been on both ends of it where I've,、um, you know, had research where we are asking、um, participants to have scans and do that. And also, you know, research studies where I'm looking for tools which,、um, you know, things like the slums and the mini mental and trying to use those. Um, but they're not necessarily the best measures.、Um, so that's one of the challenges. And then also for me, building off of what Dr. Clark said, is the sustainability.、Um, that, you know, I can go in and my, I have a similar study that was done in terms of singing with caregivers. And then when that, you know, research study is finished, that's a huge void for those、uh, caregivers and for the clients、um, to not have that singing group. So thank you for your question. Um, There's a gentleman、um, in the. In no, the no, oh, no, oh, oh, sorry. すみません。えっと、脳の脳画像の話なんですけれども、あの音楽療法の、えー、リサーチをするにあたって、どのような
ツール、道具を使っていくのかっていうのは、あの近藤先生もおっしゃられたように、すごく重要な要素だと考えています。えー、特に侵略的な、えー、脳画像を取ったりとかっていうのをお願いするんですけれども、なかなかそれを受け入れてもらうことは難しいということもご存知だと思います。また、えー、ケア、ケアギバーの、えー、介護士の方に対して音楽療法を提供してそしてもう研究が終わったら終わりなんですよというそのようなことは、えー、なかなか続けてその人の気持ちを汲み取って続けていくということは難しいことなので今後も、えー、きちんとした、えー、スケジュールを持って、えー音楽療法というのを提示していく、そしてリサーチにつなげていくということが重要だと考えられます。Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I think this will actually be our last question that we have time for. There's a gentleman just in the aisle here. I hope I didn't miss anyone on this side. I just keep seeing hands over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll try to keep this short and quick, but、uh, my question primarily is, I guess, for Kondo Sensei. And,、uh, Uh, Ms. Stewart, you could probably chime in on this as well. But、um, uh, Kondo Sensei talked about more research, more、uh, qualified and well trained MTs in Japan, and, and making it a national qualification. That seems like such a huge undertaking to, to get a healthcare profession to take music therapy, recognize it as a serious intervention in the healthcare profession. Where do we start? Where, do, where, where does someone start by having that, having a, a national healthcare system take it seriously as a, as a legitimate intervention for, for quality of life, for you know, everything else? この質問は特に近藤先生にお願いしたいんですけれども、えー、日本の国家資格のことについてお話しされていましたが、えー、音楽療法を他の専門家の方々に、えー、どのように伝えていくことによって国家資格につながるような働きかけになるかお答えいただけたらと思います。ご質問ありがとうございます、えー、高齢化に伴ってあの医療費がどんどんあの膨らんでいる現状ですのでやはりその削減ということを考えますと一つは費用対効果コストパフォーマンスの面での有効性の証明それから音楽療法の有効性の客観的な証明でですね研究をしてもっとこうどの他の多職種の方にも効果を分かっていただけるような形での効果の証明が必要かとそれから最後に3つ目ですがやはり音楽療法士のスキルアップで現場からあの求められる音楽療法士さんをもっともっとあの、えー育てていくそういう意味ではこういった場が非常に重要かと思いますけれどもその三つをしていかなくてはいけないのではないかというふうに私は考えております。Uh, she said they would have a three different point of view、uh, she would like to express and、um, first it probably the cost performance、um, between、um, music therapy and the service and secondly、um, music therapy With the research and the objective research would be more important than just the subjective、uh, results. And thirdly,、um, music therapists scale up、um, what the facility needs or what clients need. s We need to really understand、uh, what the needs for the service、um, music therapists should understand and to deliver、uh, is the important issue for the national curriculum. Qualifications. Thank you for the question. In South Africa, we may be small in number, but we are a recognized healthcare profession with our Healthcare Professions Council. So we fall under the Occupational Therapy Board,、um, and as such, we've got registration numbers. And once, once someone has completed the Masters in Music Therapy program, registration with our Healthcare Professions Board. Is compulsory, so you cannot practice without being registered by our Healthcare Professions Council.、Um, so that assists with, for example, medical aides, most of whom, not all, most of whom recognize arts therapies as a qualified allied health profession. アフリカの例を紹介すると、えー、理学療法の専門に
のっとっていっているんですが音楽療法士もマスターレベルで、えー、教育を受けていく必要があるということと、えー、メディカルの中で、えー、他の方とのコラボレーションを持ちながら理解を深めていくということが重要になると考えています。Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation and for your questions. And please join me again in thanking our four outstanding speakers. Thank you very much.